when we think about it, how many of y'all in this room have made a mistake when it comes to patient care? Probably everybody in this room has, you've never made a mistake? That's fantastic. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I mean, it, it, at this point, we have to ask ourselves the questions like, how, how do we deal with errors? How do we, in healthcare, how do we as human beings operate? And then I wanna ask you guys, there are two um, cases that are going on right now in the United States um, that are fascinating. And one of them is very much challenging the, the, the paradigms of, of just culture and stuff. Do you guys know what those two cases are? Okay, you got a case out of ketamine right now where those, where those, right. And so the, the, the paramedics out of Colorado, what, it, what, is that, what is that lawsuit about? What is she suing for? Yes, all right, yes, yeah, she, she, there, there, there is gonna be some type of payout with that, but what angle is she approaching? Are they charging those paramedics with manslaughter or are they charging them with negligence? I was gonna say, is that the one where they like declared like negligent? No, no, this is, they're, both of these are ketamine administrations. So the, the case in Charleston is, is she is looking for negligence, okay? She is suing for negligence for basically a wrongful death for that, okay? Which that makes sense. If we, if we make an error, and we'll go into a, a negligence case and we'll kind of talk about that, um, that makes sense, and that's normal, right? Because even if we make a mistake, we can still be negligent for that. Even if it was an honest mistake, it's, it's one of those things, okay? Um, the case in Aurora is different. What are those paramedics being charged with? They're being charged with manslaughter, right? So that's completely different. And all they're really saying is that the way the police engage that patient, the way that the paramedics engage that patient. Now they did give a 500 milligram dose of ketamine, which may be high. It may match their protocols. I don't know, I haven't double checked it, but that is crazy to think that we give a medication and if somebody dies, we would be charged with manslaughter for that, okay? How many of y'all would rethink your career in EMS is if we made a medical mistake and then we were criminally charged for it. How many of you guys would rethink what you're doing? It makes a big difference, right? Because we're all um, capable of making mistakes. The same question would come out was if you're in a car accident and you hurt somebody, I mean, like, what are you charged with? I mean, and, and how does that work? Do you go to jail? If you incidentally are in a wreck and then somebody dies, not drinking, not dr nothing crazy, you're doing your thing, you accidentally make a mistake and run a stop sign or something like that. Are you charged with manslaughter or is that a mistake that, that people make? So some of the trends that are going on are really, really fascinating when it comes to, to just culture. And then I wanna talk a little bit about crew resource management, which is a way that we safely do things. Can we create systems to do stuff? A lot of this conversation is um, interactive because I want you guys to tell me where you guys are drifting and you're breaking the rules out of convenience. Okay, the last two years at Greenville County, I've had to do this lecture in, a, in an online format. They've had to record it and I've had to put it out there ahead of time, which I do not like. And so when Mike asked me to talk about this topic this month, I was like, no, no, no. I, I wanna come in and talk about it because I wanna engage with you guys. I wanna ask you like, where are you drifting? Where are you drifting? Like, what are we doing in our normal practices? And then incidentally, I also understand where we tend to drift anyway, okay? Um, so this is just, a, if, if you guys, I know, I know a lot of you guys over here, um, but this is me, this is my family. You guys can clearly see there's a ton of estrogen in my life. Um, when my wife told me that uh, we were pregnant with a son, I was like, who's the dad? Because that surely can't be me, okay? Um, and on a further note, if I ever do an OB lecture for you guys, I will show you guys how ugly my son won, my son was when he was born. If he had a pair of bolts in the side of his head, I swear Frankenstein would have been the father. Like seriously, I was like, but he has redeemed himself and, and he is quite the stud now, okay? So what is the culture here at Prisma Health Ambulance, okay? What, and, and then how would you guys define culture? This is not your opportunity to take a stab at, at administration, but how is our culture here? How are you guys doing? How are you guys adhering to safety practices? Are we always doing the right thing? Are we doing stuff? How is our culture? People happy? Are they unhappy? Are you guys tired? Are you stressed? Are we overworked? Has COVID stressed the world? You guys tell me, how would you guys define culture and then talk for a minute about the culture here at, at Prisma Health? Because if you guys are amazing, then I probably don't have much more to talk about um, in the sense of if we're all doing everything right, then there's, there's, there's really nothing else to do. So how would y'all define culture? I would say that we put a, put a focus on patient safety. Okay. Go, we, we put a really good cult, uh, focus on patient safety, but maybe not crew safety. 
Okay. All right, that's good. So emphasis on patient safety, not as much crew safety as we need to. Okay, I like that. That's a great statement. Okay. Somebody that doesn't have a white shirt on. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Slide yourself on over here now. <laughs> Okay. That has changed our culture. Like he said, we've got a lot of new people coming in. And I know for me, I, I, was help, I help with new hires still. But sometimes you just kind of get burnt out. Okay. When you repeatedly continue to help and they're not understanding the culture that we, we had years ago. They're right. They're just coming into it. So we're trying to teach them our culture, which is different from what they're used to. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, and, I, and I think all those things are, are absolutely relevant when we, when we talk about culture. As we go through this and we talk about things, you guys are going to really need to think about what is your organizational culture around safety, whether that's crew safety, whether that's patient safety, and then how do you guys engage with that, okay, uh, as we go through it. So I want you guys to think for a second and, and, and really think about it. Have you guys ever made a patient error? And if you did, how did you deal with it? Does anybody want to talk about an error that they made and, and how they deal with it? Okay, most people in here, except for you, said that they, that they made an error um, at some point in their career. Nobody wants to talk about it. So I will. Okay. Um, so I'll admit I was a uh, 24-hour shift, and uh, I, I did not do a good patient assessment on a patient from a nursing home. I didn't check the eyes, and she had a bone pupil. Mm -hmm. So uh, I learned real quick not to be uh, like lazy at all. And so uh, on all our doctors' patients, they always get a check of BGL, and I check the eyes too. Just awesome. Did you have to self-report at all, or is that something you just did the personal self-reflection and said, "I made an error. I could have done something better." I felt bad enough myself. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm the same. I was baby medic on 24, and I paced the first time I ever paced a patient. It was a very old, little, small old lady. She didn't even think about it. Gave her a birth set. I gave her five items to a 90 pound woman. Um, she ended up far spine. Right. So, um, granted, it was in my protocol, so it technically wasn't an error as far as like bookkeeping went. Right. But that was one of those things where I was like, oh, yeah, you might, you can always give more, but you can't take it back. Right. Now, how did you, so it was in your protocol to do that. Yeah, so you didn't go outside your protocol, so you didn't have to self-report that or anything. No. Okay. So I'll, I'll share a story of mine. Um, years ago, um, we um, had a patient, we had a bad, um, we had a bad batch of uh, GHB that was going around our, our call area. So, um, and people would basically take GHB to potentiate their ecstasy. So they would take ecstasy, they would take GHB. Um, it potentiated that medicine, and there was a bad batch going around. And so we probably ran six or seven overdoses that weekend in the clubs around Pelham Road. I mean, we RSI'd two or three people. We intubated a few other people. It was just, it, it was just one of those things. Um, and so, yeah. What is GHB? Um, it's a, um, so GHB, they, they make it, they carry it around. It's like neon green. They carried it around in like pours. At, uh, if you had cranberry juice or something like that, like a mixer pour at a, um, at a bar or something like that. Um, but they used to sell it at GNC as a weightlifting okay. supplement. But when females took it, it had a um, like almost a date rape effect to it at certain levels and stuff. So it's a it's actually a performance and weightlifting drug. But then people figured out how to use it for the other. But for some reason, people figured out that it potentiated the the ecstasy as part of that high, um, and just somebody mixed it or used it or it was too high of a dose or something, and just people were out. So. Um, uh, we were taking, you know, obviously we were going through the care of the guy. We did all our differentials on somebody that was unconscious. We were having to provide ventilations for him. Um, we ended up RSIing him. Um, we were not able to get him intubated. 
Uh, we ventilated him till the sucks wore off. He started breathing again. We reattempted to nasally intubate him, got, a na got him nasally intubated, and then transported to the hospital. But in the process of taking care of that overdose, we gave Narcan. Just It was just part of our protocol back then, just to, to give it to see if it worked. The first two milligrams of Narcan did not work. And somewhere between me taking the other small box out of there, which I still don't know how I did this in the middle of the night, um, I ended up giving 50 of Benadryl to this patient instead of the two of Narcan. Okay. Now, for a guy that's already unconscious with those meds, is 50 milligrams of Benadryl going to hurt him? Absolutely not. In fact, when I self-reported myself to the physician, she's like, fantastic, he'll sleep better. I mean, like, I'm, that's exactly what she said to me, okay? But you have a question is, is when you give a medicine like that and you make an error, you have a choice. Do I report this or do I not? And then what level do I report that to? Do I report that to the physician that's in charge of the patient? And then do I further turn myself into administration to get a slap on the wrist, okay? And then what is my administration going to do to me? Are they going to fire me? Are they going to discipline me? Am I going to get a written warning? How am I going to handle this? Okay. Um, so I ended up telling the physician. She obviously didn't care. I self-reported to Greenville County Administration at the time. Um, they came and talked to me. I did a quick remediation on medicines and the, um, and, and the rights of giving a patient medicine. And my biggest takeaway from that is that I do med checks now every single time I give a medicine. Okay. If you work with me and a few people that have worked a good bit with me, they will tell you that I'm neurotic about it. Like I will, I will be like, hey, I'm giving 324 milligrams of aspirin to this chest pain patient. It's in date, it's the right pain. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But I will still do this today as a best practice because of that event, okay? Because if you think about it, 50 milligrams of Benadryl is not that big of a deal, but could it have been that big of a deal? Absolutely, right? We carry a lot of meds that have some high stakes in them, so, so we have to kind of work through that. So it's a good reflection for us to, to, to really think about how we deal with that, okay? The, the realization is everybody makes mistakes, but how we deal with our mistakes says a lot about our character, okay? And when we talk about just culture and we talk about crew resource management, we have to have an area of humility to understand that we can make mistakes, and then we have enough character to be able to, to stand up and how we deal with them, and we got to own some of those mistakes. Because for my case where I ran that, how easy of, of it would have been for me to say nothing in regards to the Benadryl administration and would I have got away with it? Probably, right? Because who's to say that he took ecstasy and GHB? Do you not think he mixed a little Benadryl with it? I mean, who knows if they did a tox screen on him and what they're going to look at. I feel like I, got, got, I would have got away with it and it's low consequence, but it's not the right thing to do. Okay? So again, these are all things to think about. Okay? So I had this case um, when I was finishing my master's degree. Um, I, I ended up, um, we, we had this case study, and this is completely fictitious, okay? So this is basically Bright Roads Hospital um, where Miss Smith, she had a surgical procedure done at her facility, um, and she subsequently ended up with an infection that increased her length of stay from five days to 30 days, okay? So I want you guys to think about negligence when we talk about this case, and is... Was this physician and other people involved guilty of, of negligence? Okay, but before we do that, so what are the four things that it takes to prove a negligence lawsuit? Before we get started. Okay, you're right. You've kind of combined a few of those things are kind of the same, right? So the you, you definitely said damages. Okay, so the third thing in a negligence case is you, you have to have some type of injury. Okay, so the the first thing is a duty to act, right? You call, we haul. If you're on a 911 truck or if you're on one of y'all's ambulances and you're signed in to work that day, if you get the call, then your duty to act is already assigned. Okay, there's nothing you can do with that. Okay, um, I think you kind of said it like you have a breach of duty. Okay, where you do something that is below the standard of care. Okay, do you guys think that the standard of care is really standardized and everybody agrees upon it? Okay, anybody ever been to court? Okay, anybody ever listened to an expert witness that comes in to talk about the standard of care and what's okay and what's not okay? There's a lot of fluff in what that standard of care is, okay? So you have to have uh, um, a duty to act, a breach of duty, an injury, and then what's the fourth thing? And it's actually the hardest thing to, call, to prove in a negligence lawsuit. Yes, it's, it's it, well, that, that's different. That's intent. That's different, but you're correct. So it's, it's causation or proximate cause, that what you did, your breach of duty, was the cause of that injury. And if they can prove all those things, then, then, then you can be liable of negligence, okay? Um, and, and, and you can go through that. All right, so what basically happened is, is uh, Dr. Paltrow was um, rounding after surgery, okay? 
and he was going around the surgical suite and he was checking on, you know, patient A, B, and C, and he had some residents with him. And as he was checking patient A to B to C, what do you guys think he did not do between, um, between C and patients? Okay, it actually is one step further than that. He didn't even change gloves between going and seeing this. This is fictitious. I'm not, I know Dr. Morgan's back here. He's probably sitting there like, why are you hating on physicians right now? That is not, that is not what I'm, um, no, but he did not change gloves between that, okay? So um, the patient A must have had a MRSA infection or something like that. And so, you know, patient B and patient C, which eventually was Smith Smith, um, she did get a subsequent um, uh, infection from that, okay? What was really bad about the case is there was a nurse there that saw Dr. Paltrow not change his gloves between the cases, okay? Why would she not say anything about that? She knows that's not the best practice. Why would she not say anything? Okay, because he's the doctor, and I don't want to say anything, right? Okay, so Dr. Paltrow is wrong for not following the standard of, the, the standard of care, what we would agree, changing gloves, washing hands between patients, and then the nurse... Also, it's problematic because she did not say anything about that, okay? Now, does that, does that show that we have a problem with hierarchy? We basically would put physicians up on a pedestal to say that pretty much whatever they do is okay and that they can't be challenged in what they did, okay? When they went back, obviously, we were going through this case, um, and, and they did it, and they asked Dr. Paltrow, why did you not change your gloves between the patients, and what kind of excuses do you think he offered? Okay, I'm really busy. I don't have time to do that. He didn't lie. He didn't say he did it. I mean, he owned it. He just said, but hey, I'm really busy. I didn't have time. What else did he say? Okay, no, he didn't say he, he forgot. He was a little bit more bold about it. So basically the trash cans and the sinks within the healthcare facility there were not in a conducive place. So because he's busy, he didn't have time to walk over here, take his gloves off, throw those away, wash his hands over here, and then re-glove up and go to the next patient, okay? So when we look at Just Culture and we think about it, it's the, the person. We have to take our, our humility and our ego and the, the right things to do for the patient, but there's also a system-based approach to say, is can we improve our systems to give people a better opportunity to follow the rules and, and do the right thing, okay? Now, the case got worse, um, and when Ms. Smith um, developed septic-like symptoms um, in the ICU, um, she did not want to doctor Paltrow or bother him on his time off, and so she failed to call him, so her sepsis symptoms continued overnight until he came in the next morning and stuff. And so, so anyway, so I, my, my piece of it was that I did feel like there was negligence that, that took place. Now, Ms. Smith did have a good outcome. Um, she just stayed in the hospital a little bit longer. And so my resolve for it is, is that basically the hospital would just eat that bill um, and go through that process. And, and again, that was just me going through the process. But it's fascinating to look at these cases, pay, uh, cases and how it, it develops. What was Dr. Paltrow's viewpoints? What was the nurse's viewpoint? And then what's everybody else's viewpoint from the hospital? It was really a fascinating case. Okay, so why as team members do we not speak up when we see errors? Why do we not speak up? Okay, right, right. We're, we're, we're fearful of retaliation, okay? And I, I absolutely agree with that. If I say something to you as an experienced provider, um, you know, are you going to retaliate against me, okay? And then further, if I say something to you on a call and then you don't fix it and it's a high stakes, and I always throw out the example, so if you and I are running a call together and you say, I'm going to give this patient 100 milligrams of intracardiac epi because I think that's going to work, like, I hope that at some point I look at you and say, I'm sorry, did you, you just said 100 milligrams like Pulp Fiction, intracardiac epi? Like, that's, we don't, we don't do that. And you say, I'm so sorry, I meant one milligram of epinephrine IV. And I'm like, all right, that sounds a little bit better. I hope that I would provide that challenge in that moment versus letting you do that um, and going through that process. But I wonder if you're the senior person on the truck and you have a new paramedic that just got out of paramedic school that very much knows that we give one milligram IV of epi and you say 100 milligrams of intracardiac epi, I hope that new medic has the guts to say, I'm sorry. 
I, I, wanna, I want a timeout right now to talk about what we're about to do and that you guys can resolve that for what's in the best interest of the patient, okay? The million dollar question is, is how many of you guys would challenge a senior person if you knew they were about to make a mistake? Okay, you would, you would, okay? How many of you would be hesitant about it? Okay, and when we sit there and say the hesitance, Yeah. Shoes, a lot of times if you ask a senior paramedic or somebody who's worked at a workplace longer, if you ask them about something they're about to do or what the next step is, you've got to mask your response and learn your protocol. Okay. And so and so so here we begin to break culture down. And now so now we're really digging into culture. And please, this is not a knock on Prisma Health Ambulance. It's the same at Greenville County. It's the same, it's the same in Richland County and Charleston County. It's probably the same in the operating room when you're up there, when you have two physicians that are both tenured that are working on a patient that have a disagreement. This is how we resolve conflict in, in medicine. So this is not a knock on that. Okay. Now, why does the new person or a newer person not want to say anything to challenge the senior person. Okay, they don't want retaliation. We got that. We're, we're absolutely, we don't want the retaliation. They may not know. They don't want to look dumb. Okay, and again, even though that's a, a, a reasonable reason why we're not doing something, we still have to suppress the ego on both sides to say, I have a question about something, and there's really nothing wrong with that, okay? The senior person has to be receptive to the new person asking and creating a challenge, and maybe sometimes that is education. I mean, maybe sometimes it is a conversation, but there shouldn't be nasty attitude, sarcastic comments. We should be able to resolve that conflict knowing that the patient is the one that we're advocating for, okay? That requires a huge culture change in an organization that is basically supported from the, the top down. It's infused in training, it's infused in different stuff, and it takes a long time to get there. Um, I've been teaching about this uh, within Greenville for two years, and we still have a lot of issues with this. We're still working through stuff, we're still looking at systems to be able to improve stuff. And in fact, I did a talk very similar to this for, mo it used to be mobile care um, many, many years ago. Um, and I think that I did that one lecture and then it was, I don't really know if anything happened, okay? So one of the biggest failures of Just Culture within an organization is it not being supported by administration and then not um, kind of brought up through the ranks. And the beautiful thing about Just Culture is it's not just for the crews. It's not for the EMTs and the paramedics um, and then not the educators and not administration because they're up on this pedestal and they do stuff. This type of culture infusion has to take place across the organization, okay? Um, and I think, for, who, who in here has flown on a helicopter? Okay, I know Tom has. And, and I think that Tom will probably reiterate that in aeromedical culture, because it's close enough to the airline industry that really puts an emphasis on crew resource management and checklists and safety, and patient advocacy, these things are infused in their culture and they've been around long enough that nobody bucks the system, not nobody, very rarely does anybody buck the system um, as a part of that process and they've just infused it in there, okay? If you buck the safety system in aeromedical, guess what? You don't have to work there. They have 80 paramedics that are lining up to take your job because every flight paramedic opening that comes up, they get 70 to 80 applications per job, so they got plenty of people that want to do it, okay? Um, yeah, please, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been working with baby medics who made decisions that were, even though they were within program protocol, were not the best judgment for that patient. Sure. And even when I brought it up, oh, yeah, 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 it's, it's protocol. We're, we're, I, I did what I, I'm a medic, I, I know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so there's that aspect of the culture as well, where we're looking at the letters after somebody's name and not necessarily the experience or the, um, the knowledge of gained over time. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and I and I think, and and I'll actually I'll put this off on Dr. Morgan for a minute because it's, I mean, as how would a physician resolve conflict in in an OR setting or anesthesia in your specialty? How would y'all resolve conflict between two senior physicians or attending physicians?
Right. Is there, would there ever be a case where, let's say you were about to make a poor decision and you just, you messed up a medication dose, you, I don't know, a, a lethal dose of something, you just, for some reason that was the, you had, a, you had the wrong drug in your head and said the wrong thing. If a nurse heard that and she said, how would she create that challenge to you and say, I'm, like, if she confirms that order, would it take place at that? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'd say that would be the C-U-S. Right. The, um, let's see, um, concern. I'm concerned about that dose. Yeah. That's correct. You, I'm uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable giving that dose. S, safety. I'm not sure that that's the safety oh. thing. I feel comfortable. Right. <laughs> right. And, and, and this is, yeah. And, and I like this because, just culture and crew, res crew resource management or cockpit resource management as it came out of the airline industry. Team Steps is really the, the hospital kind of healthcare version of some of the same stuff that I'm talking about. So a lot of these things all kind of bridge together um, and it's, um, it, it just, it, it all kind of flows together, okay? Um, so I think we already talked about the hierarchical system there, that if somebody is senior, we have a lot of issues with saying something to them. We're fear of retaliation. Um, we don't want to be wrong. Um, or we just don't know, okay? So how do we begin to break these barriers down? What's the one thing that everybody has to suppress to make this system work? Ego, ego right? Everybody has to suppress that ego, and systems have to be developed from the administration down to training. It has to be infused in your scenarios that are out there, and you have to have honest conversations. And when people do have conflicts, you have to help them resolve that conflict and create processes for people to, to, to be able to go through this process, okay? Um, and I think we've already talked about the, the, the other two. And I think every organization has a piece of this. Um, when I teach this in new uh, EMT programs, uh, particularly our programs over here at the hospital, we have a lot of the fire service that comes in. And it is amazing um, because this type of safety checks are infused in the fire service as well. But I will tell you right now that there was not one firefighter EMT or potential EMT um, that we taught that was willing to challenge a senior person on their shift that they're currently working for in regards to, to operational stuff, how to take care of a fire if they saw a safety concern. So even though they're teaching it in their industry, it is not, it is not done in that industry. I see some firefighters that are shaking their head. It, it will, and this is the problem, is that when you have an in the line of duty death or you have a medical error or a mistake happens, almost every single time somebody will step up and say, I knew that was a problem. And then now they have guilt or thoughts of why didn't I say anything? Or you look at systems and you say, if we knew this was a problem, why did nobody challenge that? Why did nobody say anything, okay? And this, in after action reviews on these events, these are the types of things that happen all the time. Um, so so it, it, is, it is fascinating and it's a very complex thing, okay? Sure. At least say something. I'm going to say something anyway. I don't care who you are. Sure. Uh, and then if you decide not to think about that and do it, then that's on you. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes down later after you're getting reprimanded and they come ask me, I'm not lying for anybody, I'll say what I meant to you. So, you know, that, that's at least you've done your part by saying something. Right. Yeah. And there's, a, there's another subset of that that, I'm not sure if you went to court for a medical error and you said, well, I said something to you, like the intracardiac epi, like I said, hey, man, you probably shouldn't give the intracardiac epi. And you said, no, 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 I'm going to give it anyway. And you just said, all right, we'll do what you want to. It's your ride, not mine. I highly doubt that just saying something would be enough. There has to, you really have to develop a method for that. I still think both of you would, would be liable for that, that negligent behavior. That's just my opinion, not in court. That's just because they're going to spin that. Okay, lawyers are extremely good at, at, at what they do. Okay, so just culture in and of itself is just an approach that embodies fairness and accountability, okay? Um, and so what we wanna do with a just culture is you create an environment to where you can take people's mistakes, their errors, their lapse of judgment, and you can deal with it in a non-punitive way. But you also have a subset of it, if you have negligent or reckless behavior, you can deal with that in a negligent way because if we are taking shortcuts and not doing the right things and something happens, you still have to be able to discipline that 
but for a, a, a way to look at honest mistakes that happen, you have to be able to coach and you have to be able to counsel those employees so that they learn, they grow, develop, and they don't make the same decision, okay? Just culture does not allow for you to make, a mis- make an error, lapse of judgment, make a mistake, and then say, do the same thing again, same thing again, and just keep getting coaching and counseling. At some point, you have to come to the realization that you were doing something wrong and that something needs to change to be able to fix that, okay? Otherwise, that does become negligent or deviant behavior, and it should be punished, okay? A lot of people think just culture is a is an area where it's just completely non-punitive and nobody gets in trouble, and that is not the case, okay? You can do that. The other thing I want you guys to understand that, that just culture is not outcome-based. It does not mean that if you gave a medicine, if you gave a medication error and the patient dies, well, now you have to be fired because the patient dies. It is not outcome-based. We do a lot of reviews at, at Greenville County for our different categories of responses that come in, and we look at the case for what it is, how the mistake happened. We look at the patient outcome on the other side just to see what the outcome of it is, and honestly, that's not to discipline the employee. That's to figure out how much risk and liability we are assuming as an organization for something that happens. We just, we want to have the full picture, but we do not make decisions on coaching, counseling, or discipline based off outcome of patients because that does not, that doesn't matter. Errors are errors and the outcome of the patient, that just happens to be what it is, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so I want you guys to, to see this story, okay? Um, this, is, this is a hard story to watch. So um, I, I heard this guy speak here um, at Prisma Health years ago. Um, and I think the basis of his story is it's 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 truly amazing. It's truly heartbreaking in a lot of ways, um, but it, but it is um, it, it's a very powerful story. Um, and I don't have internet. <laughs> Harrison, my oldest, and Abby, me, and my daughter, they had two unique personalities, and they loved each other and they got along pretty well. But Josh was the one thing they had in common that they both loved. Uh, because he was their little brother. And so it's kind of like putting the exclamation point at the end of our family. We had finished as a family a spring break trip to Hilton Head, South Carolina, and we were making our way back home, and we were literally five minutes from the house, and the last thing I heard my wife say that day was, oh, my word. Um, we were hit. We were hit by three guys in a Ford Explorer who ran a stop sign going about 55 miles an hour. Um, I watched as my wife took her last breath They found Josh lying in the edge of the trees, about 50 feet away from the van, and stopped. Uh, he was still strapped in his car seat, but he was lying face down on the edge of the woods, and he was unconscious. Josh was immediately sent over to Savannah, Georgia, by helicopter. And for the first four days, Josh was consistently improving. The first time I walked into the room, I was just kind of very overwhelmed. Your 17-month-old doesn't belong in a place like that. And uh, he responded to my voice that morning. He stopped the moaning noise, he rolled over and he looked at me, he smiled at me, uh, which was a neat moment. Uh, that nurse, the one that was just really, really such a sweetheart to us, she uh, she asked me if I wanted to hold Josh while I was there. I said, yeah, absolutely. She kind of laid him down in my arms and we had about 40 or 45 minutes to just kind of hold each other. Um, none of us could understand what the significance of those 40 to 45 minutes would later mean to me because it was literally the last time I held my son alive. By the time I left on Tuesday to go home for the night, I got that very strange phone call from the, from the hospital saying, can you please come back? And uh, I remember walking that room that day into the midst of what felt like a very chaotic scene. And uh, that vice president for risk management walked in the room behind me and, and he said, well, Mr. Barron, your son's head wound has caused numerous seizures throughout the weekend. When your son had one of those seizures, we ordered a medication from our pharmacy and in her haste to make up the compound your son needed, she made a mistake and she sent up what is an adult dosage. It's actually five times the strength of what's required for a child your son's size. So when it hit your son's heart this morning, it stopped. So I asked him uh, what I thought was the next logical question. I said, then who is that lady and what is she doing to him? He said, uh, Mr. Barron, uh, that lady's a pediatric cardiologist. Right now she has her hands 
uh, inside your son's chest. She's massaging his heart to keep him alive. And she's been doing it for the last two and a half hours till you could get here. I looked at him and I said, well, I guess you need to let him go then. So I went over, kissed him on the forehead, and said goodbye. Two months later, what I got was um, a very well-polished legal response. There was no acknowledgement of responsibility. And my son was no longer a son. He was in the field. So, so that's a that's a, usually a, a tough story for um, for people to watch, but I, I think it really outlines um, the um, the the case and what we're talking about. I had the opportunity, um, as did a lot of other Prisma Held leadership, to see him come and speak. Um, um, to come and speak about that, and it was a very powerful story. And when you and when you really break it down and you think about it, um, anybody is anybody can make an error, right? That pharmacist, I know for a fact that 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 she did not or he did not mean to mix that medication in the incorrect way and and give that to him. Okay. What's fascinating about the story is when he comes and speaks, he he fills in the gaps on the other side of it. Okay. How do you think that pharmacist felt after that error happened? Terrible. Terrible, right? Hard to live with that, okay? Do you think the hospital she worked for allowed her to talk to him and apologize? No. Absolutely not, okay? So there's a piece to that that the, the legal system is going to prevent an open disclosure of, of errors. Now, what's even more weird about this story in the sense that that guy from risk management and, and Mr. Barron there, they eventually formed a relationship um, and he came back and spoke at that hospital about patient errors, about the effects of those errors, about safety, about medication checks, about safe practices so that this would not happen again, okay? Isn't that crazy? The very hospital where this happened, he got to go back and speak. He eventually got to meet that pharmacist and she was able to tell him that she was sorry simply for, for, for what she did as part of the process. So there's a lot that goes into patient errors. Believe it or not, and, and I know this statistic is, is argumentative, but they say that you know medical errors are the, the third leading cause of death, okay? Um, there was a document, Error is Human, came out many, many years ago. That, that has been, they, it's been debunked in, in a lot of ways, but it's also been supported in a lot of ways because a lot of the medical errors that we have, they go unreported. And so we don't know about them or they don't catch it as part of that process. Okay? I just want you guys to pay attention. Look at the, um, look at the number of billions of dollars that are spent each year in, in, in medical errors. Isn't that crazy? To think that the very place that we go to get well, to get care, to get help, um, that, that causes these medical errors um, and, and, and is impacting us, okay? Now, let me ask you about this one right here, okay? Um, one in 30 patients on pediatrics experience a medical error, okay? Do you all believe that? How many sick kids do you all take care of? Okay, we don't take care of a lot, but when we see a sick kid, how sick are they? Sick. They are sick, and how are we expected to perform? Perfectly. Perfect, okay? Now, let me ask you all a question. When you guys went to EMT or paramedic school, how good of a job did they do you in training, training you on taking care of pediatrics? Okay. Do what? You got a PALS class, right? And, and, and this is not, we go through a whole pediatric module. The last time that when you got, and this is not a knock on y'all CP because we're not, we're not far from it, um, but when you guys do, how many pediatric sims do y'all run? When's the last time you guys did a, a, a pediatric SVT in here? and went through the adenosine or the synchronized cardio versions or the conversions or doing stuff. So when you see a kid that has clade, cl, clade, delayed capillary refill, lethargic, not breathing well, and a heart rate of 260, I mean, in real life, that gets your attention, right? So your stress level goes way up, and then now you're expected to do medication calculations, um, uh, cardio version, synchronized cardio version, conversions, and do all this, and you're expected to do it flawlessly when your body is completely stressed on an area that we don't do. So it is not hard to figure out how some of these, um, how some of these errors occur, okay? So, um, so we talked about just culture and we understand what that is. Crew resource management is a way for us to create checklists. It's a way for us to create safety mechanisms for us to be able to do things better, okay? Um, where does crew resource management come from? 
I kind of said it earlier. Airline comes from the airline industry, right? Um, many years ago, they had a, a lot of different cases, and one is um, um, uh, Eastern Airlines. They had a brand new um, plane that was the, the pride of the fleet, as they say. It was this brand new plane, and so they're not going to give it to a non-senior person. They give it to the most senior pilot that was, that was there, okay? So him and a co-pilot are flying around. They're going to wherever they need to, and they were getting ready to come in and land at their destination, and when they hit the button for the landing gear to come down, there was basically a light that came on that said that, that it was basically an indicator light saying that their landing gear did not come down, okay? So they went into the perpetual flying around and until they can figure out the issue. Everybody is troubleshooting this one indicator light. In all honesty, the landing gear actually came down. It was a faulty light that was in there, and they were so focused on that indicator light, got so task saturated on it, that somebody accidentally knocked the plane out of um, autopilot and it started to descend. The co-pilot tried to challenge the senior person, and he said, no, 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 no. We are not focused on that. We are focused on this indicator light and why these wheels are not coming down. And sure enough, the plane went all the way down into the ground. Okay, all those people died for a faulty indicator light. So they had multiple, I mean, the airline industry had multiple. So they basically said they infused, uh, it's called cockpit resource management, where they can have challenges, they have a way to diffuse stuff, and they have a checklist every single time they get on a flight, okay? If a senior pilot gets on a, gets on a plane and says, I am not going to go through this checklist today, guess what happens? They don't fly. They don't care. And if they don't want to do the procedure, then they're not going to be a pilot anymore for that airline industry. That's how serious they take it. Okay. Now, I know EMS has workforce shortages. Like, I get it. And if you guys were like, well, I'm not following the check sheet, you're not going to fire me. I realize that this takes a culture infusion. I know we have workforce shortages. I don't even, it's, I don't even want to go there. Because um, some people would say, well, you can't fire me because you don't have anybody else to replace me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so that's kind of where crew resource management comes from, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. And we already talked about its ego, okay? A lot of this is ego. A lot of our egos are very fragile, okay? We don't want to say anything to anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We tiptoe around everybody, but it's not about y'all. It's about the patient, and it's about systems and processes that get us there. And actually, when you can support a process like this, your character as a human being improves if you can receive that information and provide that information back and kind of navigate and work through some of that stuff, you actually increase your character, which to me actually in, improves the, the ego of who we are as human beings in a good way, okay? So one of the things I want to put out there, um, and this is not a slide showing that Prisma Health and Greenville County are now joining forces. That is not what it is. What I do want to prove to you guys, and I want to ask you guys the questions, that when it comes to the problems that you guys have, on a daily basis, some of the, the drifts and deviations in safety practices, do you think that we're any different? Prisma Health Ambulance and Greenville County EMS? Do you think we're any different than Richland, Charleston, Sedgwick County, LA County? We're all the same. We all have the same issues that, that are out there right now that, that are surrounding us, okay? So the three things that we look at, any event that comes in for us that, that, that I look at is I, I look at negligent or deviant behavior, okay? Did you do something that was below the standard of care that is not correct, that you are not supposed to be doing um, and you know better, okay? That is dangerous or negligent behavior. But also understand there's something called a drift, okay? Sometimes, am I going over on time? You sure? What time do I need to be done? No, I, no I'll be, no, listen. Yeah. No, okay, all right. I just want to make sure. So there's something called a drift, okay? And, and I'll give you guys an example, okay? We call them, well, I don't call them that, but um, our field crews uh, in Greenville County, some of them call the shoulder straps that, are gonna, that go around the patient's shoulder to kind of protect them, they call them supervisor straps, right? Because we only put those on when the supervisors come around. Somebody told me that. The biggest question is, is that when, and, and this, this is the same, um, when I was working um, here, I would come in, and where do you guys think I found the shoulder straps on y'all's stretchers here? They're tucked up behind there, right? So what we know is neg that's negligent behavior. You are not using a safety belt that you're supposed to put on your patient that will secure their shoulders in the event that you were in an accident. But this culture here considers that normal because it is, it is, 
it is not normal for me to come in and see them ready to go for the patient. They are tucked behind there, okay? So that's a culture drift that we have here where normative culture is ac actually negligent and kind of deviant behavior, if that makes sense, okay? So you can have that culture develop, so we have to call it out and we have to do something about it, okay? Um, the other thing I look at is was it an honest mistake? Okay. Did somebody make a mistake? Did they not assess something that needed to be on a patient? That was an oops. If I did a clinical review on that, we would have had a talk. If it was severe enough, medical control would have joined me for that. It had gone down as a coaching or counseling. Not a written warning, not a verbal warning, not whatever, um, but it's an honest mistake. You did something, you learned from it, we all walk away, and guess what? You're a better clinician for it today, and, it's, and, and that is a good thing. Okay. Um, and then also look and see if we have a system issue, okay? Some of the things that we experience, some of the medication errors that are reported to us, if there is a logical reason or a system issue that that occurred, then we go back to the system and we say, man, I, I, I mean, that's, I, we can't really help that. We've got to create a better system for our employees to be able to operate safely within the, the, the constraints of that, okay? Um, the other thing, so opportunities for improvement, okay? Um, at Greenville, we added a timeout um, at the at the end of our or in the middle of our RSI process, okay. Before we do that high risk procedure, you got your meds pulled up, you got everything, you're getting ready to do your med checks. You should be doing a timeout to say, is this the right procedure? Is my suction set up? Do I have my alternate airway? Do I have my my secondary alternate airway set up? Are we prepared for this? If it's a burn patient, do you have a tube smaller, bigger, whatever the case may be, you're really going through that process to make sure that you're doing the right procedure for the patient um, and that you're going through that. I took a snapshot of y'all's protocol last night um, and I see that you guys do have a timeout right here, okay? Now be honest, the last time that one of y'all did an RSI, who did their timeout? You did a timeout? You did it? Did anybody not do it? Last time they did an RSI. And you don't have to admit it, but I'll ask Dr. Morgan, since he's in anesthesia, do you guys not do a timeout before every surgery? They do one before every surgery, right? And that's standard. Do not deviate from it. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing is that's, well, okay, all right. I'm, I don't mean, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you were going to be in here, and, like, I know Dr. Morgan really well, and we've, I, I just, it's, I just was an opportunity because, as I've read some of this stuff and I've, I've studied it about timeouts before we do high risk procedures, the one place that I went to for information was OR and anesthesia. I went to that because that, as I understand that culture, they're very good at that. That is standardized. It's safety. It's about the patient. Make sure everybody's comfortable with what is going on. And if there's conflict, you resolve it before you move forward. So it, it's a good thing. Okay. So, um, so opportunities there. Okay. Um, what about swabbing y'all's medication ports before you guys give medicines? Do we do that every single time, or do we sometimes do it, or do we say, well, they're in cardiac arrest, we don't have to swab this port, okay? It's just a question and opportunity. It's just little things that I see, because here's the thing, is if you don't swab a medicine port, and there ends up with any bacteria on it, what kind of, uh, not specifically, but what's a um, medical people-induced infection? Okay, so it's a nosocomial infection, right? It's, a hot, it's, a, it's an infection that occurs because of that. If they can prove that's where it came from, guess who doesn't get paid? The hospital, right? The hospital doesn't get, uh, so if you're not swabbing your sipes, if you're not doing sterile procedures, I want to say at the hospital it was urinary catheters this last year. They had a lot of infections secondary to that. That cost the healthcare system a ton of money, plus it's bad for your patient, so you do training on how to use aseptic technique and do these things correctly. This is just an area of opportunity. I'm sure everybody is swabbing their ports, but I'm sure at some times we probably don't, and it's just a time to come back that if I'm working with Rita um, and she sees me getting ready to not swab my port I hope she yells at me in Hungarian <laughs> and tells me to swab that port and I'll be like yes ma'am I'm gonna swab this port and we're gonna clean it I hope that we can that we have that kind of relationship to, to be able to do that okay She'll and do what <laughs> yeah all right and then I also put the supervisor straps up there okay because we know that those straps are tucked behind there okay some people are using them as they should some people did not, okay? But when you go back to a negligent um, thing, your job in EMS is to safely move the patient from point A to point B 
any variation of that, you're going to lose a negligence lawsuit, right? You're supposed to safely take them from where they are at their house or hospital, put them on the stretcher, safely secure them to that stretcher, safely take them out to your ambulance, transport them from point A to point B, and then safely move them to wherever they are at the hospital destination or back at their home. If you don't put the shoulder straps on and you get in a wreck and they have an injury, they're going to come back and say, if you'd have those shoulder straps on, and there's nothing you can do to defend yourself. Nothing that I can think of in the world. Your, your organization, you're not going to go to court for that. Your organization is going to say, what kind of check? It's going to go to risk management, and they're going to say, how much can we write to that patient? So it's like one of the first questions they ask. Mm-hmm. Like yes, and, and that's the thing, is that, but we all know we're drifting on it. Okay, so we just take that extra step to do it because do you guys really want to go home with the guilt? Let's say somebody was a, um, a discharge out of the hospital and they were riding and they ended up getting in a wreck and they ended up paralyzed because they slid off the back end of the stretcher and stuff. And then now you as a provider, if you're not that, I mean, you go home and you think about it and you're like, man, if I had just put the shoulder straps on, then that patient would have been secured on there and stuff. Now you have to live with that, kind of like the pharmacist did in the, in the video on there and stuff. And we don't want to live with that. It's the little steps that we take on the front side of stuff that can avoid that air catastrophe. We already have enough, we already have enough PTSD and mental health issues in EMS for the types of calls we run. We can't ha we can't help what happens to people. We really don't need that level of guilt put on ourselves because typically we're hard on ourselves, right? Nobody comes to work and says, "I want to hurt somebody today." It's just not the heart of it's not the heart of who we are, and it's not what we do. That's okay? also a good example of how management has worked towards making it better, easier for us to follow safety policies. In that you remember the old ones that had the two hooks, and that they yeah. were pain in the ass to use, and they were not, and nobody used them. When we got these that had the two buckle, I don't know anybody. Sure. So it was a good example of how the management was able to transition for us and make it something more, more usable, user friendly for us to keep with that policy. Sure, absolutely. So it actually, the yeah. Oak Home, about this time last year, had that wreck mm -hmm. where the DUI got hit them. The patient had an open abdomen and they actually had all the straps on them. And they said that's what possibly saved that guy's life. Even though it had an open abdomen, he had all the Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. But these are just things that I know. I mean, I've been in this industry a long time and I've talked to a lot of people. And even being in administration, I actually have a really good relationship with a lot of folks and people feel comfortable talking to me in a lot of cases. And so I learn a lot about our culture and what we do. And then I try to bring that back in a, in a way that um, is meaningful, that can help our organization improve, not to smack people over the head um, and go through stuff. Okay. Um, so we're, we're getting better as a culture in Greenville County. Um, we do have a medication cross-check that, that we're supposed to do. Do we have great compliance on that? I don't know. I'd say I, my guess is 50-50 of the folks that I've talked to in the field. A lot of people say they're doing it all the time, and a lot of folks admit that they're not doing it. Um, I can tell you last year that a lot more people, the first year that I was at Greenville County, very few people reported any medication errors. This last year, from the changes in culture that we've had, um, I've probably had six to ten um, self-reported med errors um, to where we basically are doing coaching and counseling. Now, the problem becomes is every single one of those crews that had a medication error, when I asked them, did you do a medication check, they said no. So you coach, you counsel, you work through that process. The question for me becomes if they have another med air and they didn't do the med check, how do you handle that? I've not completely worked through that issue yet, but I'm, 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 I'm working through it because that is negligent. It's a drift. It's deviant behavior. We've coached. We've counseled. Now we have repetitious. I'm working through that. But this was one of the things right here. So we had a crew that had an anaphylaxis patient um, that was very, very sick. They were working hard to kind of help this patient turn the corner. Um, and they intended to give albuterol to a patient, but they end up giving duoneb instead. Not that that's really that big of a deal in the sense of what it is, but in the sense they gave an unattended medication. And honestly, when I looked at those two, and you guys probably are in the same boat, when you look at your uh, duoneb versus your albuterol, that's a clear... That's a clear thing. I, I, can, I can barely, now I can't see crap anymore. Like I'm reading glasses now. Like I'm, last time I went to the eye doctor, the lady's like, well, you're getting closer to 40. Now I'm over 40. I can't see anything. I was on a cardiac arrest a few weeks ago and it was dark in there and like Raymond, Raymond was handing me the drugs and I was trying to like do my med check and look at the expiration date and like I was doing this. And everybody started making fun of me. I was like, I hate you guys. This is terrible. Um, 
So, but it did, it made sense to me. It's a clear casing there for Duoneb um, and Albuterol. And so we basically had our inventory, our, our logistics area color, like color the crap out of that for our Duonebs to designate a difference between them. I would prefer to leave them in the packages as is when they're put out there, but for some reason that is not in their workflow. So we said, if that's not in your workflow, then we want you to color the crap out of them to make sure, and hopefully on our trucks, that, that the ones we've checked, that they did this because that was a system error. Okay, if we have something that you can't see, then we have to improve the system for that. So um, we went to work on that, and, and again, it was counseling for them. Okay, uh, what about driving? I'm guessing that you guys have not wrecked any ambulances in the last couple of years, <laughs> right? Okay, right, so that, that happens, right? So when we think about it, what are the two biggest things that we are probably doing as an organization uh, for here that are contributing to our wrecks that you guys can prevent? Okay, distracted driving, and it's not just your cell phones, right? It's you guys talking about your um, significant other issues, your kid issues, worrying about stuff. Driving is a high risk procedure, okay? On the aircraft, um, when you go through a uh, restricted airspace, who talks? Tom Isabel flew. The pilot, that's it. the pilot, and that's it. When you're taking off and landing, who talks? The pilot. The, the pilot, and that's it, unless I see something that we're getting ready to hit in which I yell stop. And the pilot's going to pull it to a stop. That is standard. It's called a sterile cockpit. Um, and that's something they do. Now, I'm not saying every time you're driving to a call, you have to be completely silent, but we are distracted driving a lot. Um, you know, we have MDTs in Greenville County. We're sitting there scrolling and we're looking at the last 35 times we've gone to this address. Okay, we're trying to figure out what's wrong with them. Okay, these are the things we're doing and it can be distracted because the drivers do it too. If the other crew member doesn't care, like when I worked with somebody a few weeks ago, I worked a night shift and they're like, oh yeah, look at the history, look at the history. I was like, I don't care, man, this is wrong, I don't care. Doesn't matter. And they're trying to grab a computer and scroll down and look at stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? Who cares? Just run the call. Doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, so distracted driving and what else? Speed. Those are the two biggest things that contribute to it, and those are things that you guys can control. Okay, you can destroy your distracted driving, and you can control your speed. Yeah, right. And it's but these are the things. Okay, and it's 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 we go through the process. So one final thought for you guys, because every time that I teach here, uh, I have to take a dig at uh, at Aaron Dix. So when he talks about leadership and motivation, it's give a shit and get shit done. Okay. That's, that's Aaron Dix. By the way, Aaron Dix does not look like this, okay, just so you guys know. Uh, I've worked out with him for many, many, many years, still do to this day, and he doesn't look close to that, okay? He actually looks like he's in his second trimester um, of pregnancy. <laughs> so, if he was here right now, he would tell you guys that Phil Head has been, more on, been, been on more diets as if a 16-year-old girl trying to fit in a prom dress. Like, that's his t standard joke for me as well. So just know that it always comes around full circle and it comes back, okay? Um, I, I do think the, the world of Aaron, we're obviously good friends and stuff, um, but just to, to leave you with that, okay? Um, one thing about leadership, okay? And, and I, I love leadership topics. Um, if there's three things that I listen to on a podcast, it's going to be leadership, something religious, or something uh, about health and wellness, weightlifting and stuff like that, just, just diet, nutrition and stuff. Those are my jams, but I listen to the most leadership stuff just because it's a, it's a fascinating topic to me, okay? Um, so the, the, the law of influence, okay? Each of y'all as individuals has a chance to lead the organization in a better way, okay? To talk about patient safety, to put the straps on, to swab your med ports, to make sure you're not driving too fast, to make sure you're not distracted, to, to be able to call out ears. You as a new person should be able to say to somebody like, hey, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that, okay? If it's an ALS, and we're not talking about the, you know, your EMT partner trying to make every patient a chest pain so it becomes an ALS ride, but if you as an EMT are truly not comfortable riding a patient, ask the question, there's nothing wrong with that to resolve that conflict. I have had that happen to me, and what I have done in the past with that is I was like, I will go ahead and take the call, and I'll ride the patient as a BLS patient, and then we would talk about it afterwards and, and try to do that education. Not to make them feel bad, not to shame them, not to guilt them, but just to say, I'll take the call and BLS it. I'll take that responsibility, but let's talk about it afterwards and get comfortable with it, okay? And if I ever had the thought that I should have worked somebody up, I'd probably just go ahead and work them up anyway because I don't want to go home and be laying in bed at night and think, gosh, well, if I'd have worked that patient up, maybe I would have caught this or I would have done this or, or something different, okay? So we have to think about us as, as leaders because everybody is one. Your ability to influence others is huge, okay? This, this is an administration issue. It's an education issue, but 
we can tell y'all what to do, put procedures in place. Y'all have to follow it. So really, you guys are the most important ones when it comes to this, not the, the, the people that are, that are doing that. Okay? So personal accountability, it's really just a means to, to um, patient advocacy and safety. And that's it. That's, that's all I have for you guys. I know um, um, Mike wanted to talk to you guys for a few minutes about a new policy that you guys have um, that, that's coming out to help guide some of this process, which I, I, don't, I don't know anything about. But he was going to talk to you guys at the tail end of this. Um, but do you guys, before I, um, and I'll sit around for a few minutes um, while he finishes up. Do you guys have any questions for me? Was this okay? Yeah, Is it all right? All right. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. That, I should, that was my last slide. Any questions? <laughs> questions, comments, pondering thoughts or ideas?